All right, tip number two is, you know, embrace or don't resist your God-ordained role in the family. And, you know, this is something that, you know, it's not popular in the world today, um, that they're trying to change the role of a husband and a wife, change the role um, of your genders. But, you know, if we don't embrace what God has ordained, I think it can lead to a lot of problems. It can lead to a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, disorder in the family. Um, but let's read in Ephesians 5 uh, what God has for the husband and the wife. Uh, verse 21, it says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And I think it's a powerful statement there that the Bible says that the wife should be subject to her husband as the church is subject unto Christ. Now, how is the church subject unto Christ? I mean, in everything, right? Anything that Christ commands the church to do, the church should do it. And that's why it says here in verse 24, it says, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So I believe the Bible is teaching us here that if your husband commands a wife, if a husband commands a wife to do something, if it's not contrary to the word of God, she ought to do it, right? Because it's in everything. So if he tells you to do something, as long as it's not sinful, you have an obligation to obey him. But what's the flip side? In verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then um, verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So if we embrace um, the God-ordained roles that God has given us in marriage, that the man should be, you know, the, the loving leader to protect and to provide. The woman as the submissive helper, you know, support and nurture the children. You're going to have unity in your family. You're going to have one direction. You know, you're going to have one goal. You're going to have um, one final authority. And, you know, we need to trust. We need to trust that God knows what's best for us. You know, sometimes we get this attitude with God like children do. Like, you know... You know, sometimes we have this attitude with God, like, oh, you know, God just doesn't want me to have fun. And, you know, believers will often accuse God of that. Well, they say God has all these rules in place because God doesn't want me to have any fun. God's just trying to put it like poo-poo on my parade. But, you know, God loves us and we need to trust that God has um, best intentions for us. And, you know, God doesn't give us commandments because they're bad for us, because he wants us not to have fun. He gives us commandments because they're better for us. You know, the Bible talks about the, the commandments are ordained for life, um, not, not for death. It's just that we aren't able to keep them all. And, you know, it's funny that, you know, the Bible, you know, if you think about it, the Bible was written, you know, how many, thousand, how many hundreds of years ago? And, you know, people have this frame of mind that, um, you know, that th this whole women's live movement is something new of trying to get women out of the home, trying to get women, you know, to, to get other people to raise your kids. But it's not, there's nothing new under the sun. The reason why the Bible talks about what women being keepers at home is because hundreds and hundreds of years ago, even at the time of Christ, women were not doing what they should be doing, which is keeping the home and raising their children and letting their husbands go out to work to provide for the family uh, and, and following their God-ordained roles. Now, one thing I want to note here is, you know, it doesn't mean that husbands can't help with the wife's responsibilities. You know, meaning that even though it is the responsibility of a mother and a wife to, you know, cook and clean and take care of the children, us as men shouldn't have the frame of mind that, yes, even though the woman is responsible for it, that it's somehow feminine if you help out with those chores. Because I know in a lot of cultures, for example, um, they have, they have this mindset that if a man changes a diaper, that he's somehow more feminine. 
Whereas, you know, I don't believe that is the right way to look at it because it means that you're not going to help your wife when she needs help around the house. And if you're going to want a lot of children, you're going to have to change some diapers. You're going to have to wash some clothes sometimes or hang out some clothes. You're going to have to help with the cooking. So if we have this frame of mind that somehow it's macho not to help your wife, I, I personally think you're less of a man if you don't help your wife and help her, um, you know, especially if she's going to be she's pregnant and she needs help. Um, you need to help your wife uh, do those things because um, she's not going to be able to do it all on her own. You guys, you guys have to be a team. So, you know, just because the wife is responsible for the home doesn't mean that the husband shouldn't help out. It's just that the wife is um, accountable if the, the, the home is not in order. And, you know, I've come, to, I've come to the conclusion, you know, when I think about, you know, the wife staying at home and the husband going out and working. Because, you know, some people will say, well, what, what difference does it make? If, what if the wife can make more money and, and go out and work? Why can't the husband stay at home and, you know, cook and clean and look after the kids? And, you know, I, I thought about it and I think, you know, if, if you only have a couple of kids or you only have one kid, then I suppose it could work, right? Like if you've got one kid and that kid is grown up, and now you want to switch roles and, you want, and, and the husband stays at home and the wife goes out and work, could you make that work? You could, right? Like if the woman made more money and you switched roles and she did the, the role of a man. But you know, when I thought about this, I, I think the reason why God doesn't have it that way is because it, it limits... Uh, I haven't really thought about how to explain this, but I think the reason why God... God doesn't have it that way is because if women go out and work and men stay at home, it's going to limit the amount of children you can have. Because if a woman is having a lot of children, she's not going to be able to hold a day job, right? Because you're going to be, I mean, even with my wife, I don't know if you saw that blog post that I did, but my wife, if you were to count up the amount of months that Elizabeth has been pregnant, right, compared to the amount of months she hasn't been pregnant. She's been more pregnant than she has not been pregnant. I mean, how is she meant to hold a job to provide for the family as well as raise the children and be pregnant more than 50% of the time? Because women will say, well, that's what maternity leave is for, right? Maternity leave is there so that a woman can have children and she can still work. To be honest, I don't even think, you know, businesses should be forced to provide maternity leave. I mean, it's not fair for a business to hire a woman and if she gets pregnant, pay her salary for six months just because she's got pregnant. I mean, but the only reason why these laws are in place is because women are voting it in and women think they have a right to a job even though like, they have children. That, that's why maternity leave, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm against. It, sh it shouldn't be happening. If a business wants to do that, that's, that's their prerogative, right? If they can afford maternity leave in order to hire women that want maternity leave, that's fine, but that's not why businesses have maternity leave. Mater businesses have maternity leave and paternity leave now because they're forced to do it by the government. Um, and it's not right to do. And you know, if a woman, if we didn't have, and to be honest, I think if a business had maternity leave, and most businesses do, if somebody like my wife had a job with that company, I'm sure that they would find a way to try and make her redundant because they wouldn't want to keep paying out maternity leave every year after year after year after year and, and, and have her keep her job. So it just doesn't work. So when this is, this is the conclusion I've come to is, you know, the reason why Satan wants to change the roles is number one, it's going to prevent how many children you can have because you can't have a lot of children if the wife is out working. She's not going to progress very far in her career if every two years she has to take off, you know, uh, uh, 12 months to raise children. Um, and also it then means that your children are going to be put in daycare or your children are going to be put in school um, and you're not going to be raising your kids and training your kids as God would want you to do. So... You know, this is why we need to embrace these roles because, you know, if we want to have a successful marriage, we want to have a successful family, you know, remember, we start a family to raise godly children and to raise a lot of godly children. And, you know, I think there's nothing that Satan hates more than us mighty men, you know, making some more arrows, right? If, if you know, if we're making some more arrows, I'm sure that's something that Satan is going to try and stop. But somebody might ask the question, you know, when we talk about roles, well, why should, they say, well, why should the man be in charge and why not the woman? But then you can ask the question, well, why should the woman be in charge? 
Right? Like, if you're going to ask the question, why should man be in charge? I mean, then you can equally ask, well, why should the woman be in charge? So that's why we need to have an authority that comes from outside of us. Because if, it just, if, if, if we're deciding who's in charge in the family, just based on our own opinions, then we'll never come to an agreement. Because then it's just majority rules, right? Or whoever's, uh, you know, can, can out, outwit the other, uh, other partner. But, it, that, you know, thank God for the Bible that we, we have an order. We have authority from above that sets in order the authority in a family and then we have peace and order in a family because when it comes to making tough decisions, when it comes to making decisions in a family, we have an authority structure that we can appeal to and that we can follow that comes from something uh, outside, of, um, outside of ourselves. And again, that comes back to the question of you know, what is the source of truth? You know, when we talked about last week, you know, why is homosexuality wrong? Why is certain sins wrong? Well, why is the husband in charge? It just comes back to, well, that's what the Bible says. But we can understand why um, God has uh, men in charge. So if family authority doesn't come from the Bible, then whose opinion should overrule the other? You know, we have peace and order. But we learn from the Bible that women are more emotional, aren't they? And they're more easily swayed by emotion. It, it is a generalization, but that is the nature of women. And I believe God wants stability in a family. He wants stability, you know, doctrinally, philosoph philosophically, um, and men are more inclined to be able to hold those positions uh, more stable. So the Bible says here that the husband is the head of the wife. And I talked about, you know, the husband being the head in everything. So obviously in Romans 13, the Bible says that we submit, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. And that's why if your husband commands you to do something that is contrary to the Bible, then you have an obligation to obey God rather than men. But if your husband commands you to do something that is not contrary to the Bible, then you have an obligation to obey God and be subject unto your husband. Now that doesn't mean you can't voice your opposition, right? Or you can't voice your opinion. And I think husbands, if we're going to be a, a loving leader, we need to listen to our followers, don't we? We need to listen to people that are subject to us. Like politicians, they should listen to the people that they're leading. So it doesn't mean that you know, your opinion is not respected, your opinion is not wanted, that your opinion doesn't matter. But I think what it does also mean is that you don't always need to give your opinion, right? Because if you're always giving your opinion, then... Um, sometimes you know, it, it, it will cause a lot of strife in your family. Sometimes you want to just, you know, if you know that your husband has thought about it and that he has decided on something, then you can keep the peace in the family and just obey him and do it. I want to show you a couple of these verses in Proverbs. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but I find them um, a bit amusing. Um, Proverbs 27 verse 15. Because one thing you know, I want to say to the women in this room <laughs> is, you know, women, should, you should strive to be a wife to your husband and not a mother. Because he already has a mother, doesn't he? And when you marry a man, you're not his authority, you're his wife, aren't you? You have to be subject unto him. Um, you know, uh, a man, you know, if he's left his father and mother, shouldn't be under the authority of his mother. But, you know, as, as men, sometimes we're used to being under the authority of our mother and our mother, you know, tells us to do things and sometimes we get in the habit of just blindly, you know, obeying them and doing it. I don't think we, as adults, we have to obey our parents. We should respect our parents. Children should obey their parents. But, you know, as a woman, you should strive to be a, a wife to your hus husband and not a mother to your husband. Look at what the Bible says about... Um, of, about women. It says here in uh, Proverbs 27 verse 15, it says, a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. So what do you think of when you see that verse? You probably think of a woman that's, you know, it's nagging her husband, you know, mothering him. And it's like a continual dropping. It's just something that's always there and it's really annoying. Um, and that's what the Bible's saying. It's contention, a contentious woman is like. Uh, look at Proverbs 21 verse 9. Look at this one. It is better to dwell in a corner of a housetop, of the housetop, than with a brawling woman in a wide house. So this bio, this verse is saying here that you would rather live in a very small house um, with a woman that that is not annoying you than with a with a brawling woman and have the biggest mansion and have the biggest house. Um, and I just want to show you this last one, Proverbs. 
only got 19 in the same chapter. Look at this one. It is better to dwell in the wilderness <laughs> than, than with a contentious and angry woman. So the Bible is saying here, it's better not even, not even to have a house than to dwell with a contentious and an angry woman. So what does that tell you? Don't be a brawling woman. Don't be a contentious and angry woman. Don't be a continual dropping to your husband and you'll have peace and um, order in your home. So women should strive to be a wife and not a mother to their husbands. Now, let, now let's go on to the husbands because I know, you know a lot of people, you know, they're really hard on, on wives, but let's go back. Uh, let's go to first, sorry. So we read, you know, we read in Ephesians 5 that, you know, the husband is the head of the wife. But remember it says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. So there's the other side of the equation, right? That, um, that the husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church. And what did Christ do for the church? He died for the church, right? He provides for the church. So, you know, like, because, you know, I, I believe that women are property of men. And you might, and people might say, oh, I can't believe you'd say that. I can't believe that women, uh, you'd say that women are property of men. Well, you know, a couple of things to think about. One is, you know, my wife, my wife is happy to, to belong to me because she knows that I love her. She knows that I love God. She knows that I have an obligation to God to provide, to protect, to, to look out for her best interests, right? So she doesn't mind being my belonging. So it's not about, you know, it, there's not a problem with belonging to somebody. Remember, it's about how you treat them. And this is why I don't have a problem with belonging to God. Because why, why would I want to belong to anyone else? You know, I want to belong to God because he's, he's, he's the greatest that there is. He, has, he knows what's best for me. He loves me. He is going to look out um, for my best interests. So, you know, you know what's funny when you, when you talk about um, women being property? Is, you know, some men would do well if they did treat their wife like their property, right? Because if you think about how some men take care of their property, how they take care of their boats and they take care of their cars and they take care of their, you know, their racing bicycles. You know, that seems to be the new thing, right? Like not bicycles, just men. I don't know, like those of us that work in a corporate environment, how men just spend so much money and time tweaking their bikes and buying little add-ons so that they can ride to work. Um, you know, how much time people spend on their houses. I mean, think about it. If you, if you spend a, as much time researching on the internet, you know, how to, to be a blessing to your wife as you did that certain part for your car or your bike, you know, your relationship might be a lot better. I mean, if you spend as much time on the weekends, you know, with your car, tinkering with your car as you did with your wife, your relationship would uh, probably be better. So I just think it's, you know, it's, and it's, it's, I don't know if it's ironic. You know, it's ironic that, you know, men get a lot of pleasure from tinkering with these toys and these gadgets and things like that. But if they spent as much time on that gadget or on that toy as they did with their wife, their wife would probably bring them a lot more pleasure. You know, not just in the bedroom, not just talking about that sort of pleasure, but just, you know, be more pleasant to be around and, and, and have, a, have a, a more uh, blessed family and a more blessed environment and not, you know, the, the sort of environment that we were talking about when we looked at those verses in Proverbs. So, you know, some men would do well if they treated their wives as well as they did, you know, some of their belongings and spent as much time with them. But the reason why I'm, I'm turning here to 1 Peter 3, because, you know, even though women can, are seen as property of men in the Bible, but, you know, it, it doesn't mean that they're, they're dehumanized because it's, you know, it's, it's a different type of problem. Because, you know, just like men, how they treat, you know, their cars and their bikes and their things like that. And, you know, you can have property that you really care for that you really love. So it's the sort of property that you love, that you care for, that you have their best interests at heart, that you protect and value, that you're to the point that you're even willing to give your life for. I mean, you're not probably willing to give your life for your car or your boat or for your house. You know, some people maybe. But the Bible's saying here that we ought to treat our wife. So she's not just any type of property, um, but she belongs to the husband nonetheless. Look at what it says here in 1 Peter 3. It says here, likewise, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that al they also may be without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. 
whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on and of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, look, which is in the sight of God of great price. So a woman in the sight of God is of great price and a man ought to view his wife the same. She's an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is of great price. Let's read on. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. And here we go. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So, a couple of things I just want to point out here. You know, the Bible talks about the wife being an ornament, the wife being of great price, the wife being a, a, a weaker vessel. And is she weaker in strength? Well, generally, yes. Women are generally weaker in strength. But when you think of the term weaker vessel, think of something that is fragile. Right? How do you treat something that's fragile? You treat it with a lot of respect, right? You're very gentle with it. You know, when you, when you place it down on the table, you know, you, you'd be, you'd, you would be very careful and very graceful with it. That's how we ought to treat our wives. We treat them having a lot of value. Because when people think, oh, my wife's like property, you, you think of property that, you know, like a, like a child's toy, right? Like that's their property. They just throw it and just throw it against the wall and treat it like trash. That's not the sort of property the Bible's saying to treat your wife as. The Bible's saying that she's a, an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. She's a weaker vessel that we need to be careful with, that we value and that we take care of and that we protect and um, look out for. So, you know, that's why, you know, instead, instead of getting our values from the world when we talk about the roles of family, instead of getting them from the world and questioning God, we ought to get our values from the word, right? And renew our mind, have the right perspective. And, you know, instead of rejecting what God has in the Bible and thinking, oh, you know, it's patriarchal and blah, 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 we should just embrace what God has and then understand why God has it that way, rather than embracing the philosophies of the world and rejecting what God has.